The sale of electric vehicles is increasing around the world, and their future seems bright. But why? We'll answer this question on Talking with Henrietta, coming up next. <music> Hi, I'm Henrietta. Welcome to the show. Some of the latest statistics show that the sale of electric vehicles passed the 2 million mark at the end of 2016. In the U.S. alone, there were about 542,000 electric vehicles on the road as of the end of last year. On this show, I'll talk with three electric vehicle owners about some of the pros and cons of having an electric vehicle and what the future might hold when it comes to vehicle ownership. My first guest, who is seated to my left, is Ariane Erickson. Ariane is in charge of special projects at Actera, a Palo Alto organization that informs and empowers local citizens to take action on behalf of the environment. She currently oversees Actera's Go EV program, which strives to accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles in the Bay Area. Jim Barbera is seated beside Ariane. Jim has been an electric vehicle enthusiast for nine years, and he's logged 80,000 all-electric miles. Since 2008, Jim has worked as a systems engineer at ChargePoint the nation's largest network of EV charging stations. He is considered knowledgeable about all aspects of the EV life. Ron Freund is my third guest. Ron has been involved with electric vehicles for nearly 20 years. Trained as an electronics engineer, he purchased a converted, a used converted electric vehicle and now drives electric for all of his daily errands. His family has three EVs. I was told that his formula for success is EV plus PV equals near self-sufficiency in energy. Well, thank you so much for joining me. So for our audience and others who might not know, Ron, what's EV plus PV and how does that equal self-sufficiency and energy. Okay, let me uh, give some backgrounds. We're gonna probably load up a lot of uh, acronyms here in this show. EV stands for electric vehicle, and that's one of my big passions. PV is photovoltaic, and those are the solar panels that are on the roof. Between those two things, uh, it's an equation where all my electric miles are powered by the sun, and uh, my electric, uh, electricity usage at home is also powered by um, the, the solar panel, so I'm almost self-sufficient. My goal is to be net zero, but I have a gas water heater. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I'm almost at self-sufficiency. I, I look forward to the day when I can literally flip off the so grid. So can you imagine <laughs> when we're all self-sufficient? Does that mean PG&E will have to go out of business? Hmm, interesting. Or other <laughs> utility companies? Well, they're struggling right now with what we call distributed energy resources. And because it used to be the classic model, centralized power plant, big coal burner at Hunter's Point in downtown San Francisco or wherever. And then more and more, and since last 20, 25 years or so, people are putting up their own little power generators. And those are called distributed resources. And they make the grid a little more resilient instead of relying on the power plant in some central place and all those well, wires. Well, I am sure the utility companies will find a way to charge us. Oh, you know it. I mean, <laughs> like the water companies, you know, when you use less water, then the rate goes up. Yep. And, <laughs> I know that so that will be. Now, just to make sure we're all on the same page, when we talk about electric vehicles, what are we talking about? It's not necessarily um, uh, something that we all should know, is it? So, when we talk about electric vehicles, well, what's an electric vehicle? An electric vehicle uh, derives its primary power from electricity as opposed to gasoline. 
So a gasoline is a liquid fuel, put it in the tank, drive, go and fuel again. Electric vehicle, uh, there are two major classes. There's a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. That's a hybrid vehicle, which we're more or less familiar with, that has a gas engine and an electric power plant as well. And uh, you drive until the battery is depleted, and then it switches seamlessly to the gas engine, and you keep driving. And you can fuel it either way, with, by plugging it in to your wall or by uh, fueling it with gasoline. And so that's the hybrid. That's the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Then there's also the battery electric vehicle, which has no gasoline engine at all. It runs uh, entirely <laughs> on battery power and uh, the electric motor. That's the purest way. That's the purest. So it seems to me with an electric vehicle, we still will be using electricity. So Absolutely. the utility companies will still Absolutely. stay in business. They'll be very happy. <laughs> if I look forward 50 years, we won't have um, the oil companies running the world with you know, fueling airplanes, fueling ships. There'll be electric everything, and then the oil companies and the power companies can beat it out with who's going to oh, go well, to the customer. Oh, well, um, the oil companies will probably buy the utility companies. Hmm? They could. Interesting. <laughs> I don't fundamentally have a problem with the oil companies because there are a lot of other uses for petroleum, right? Plastic. Just the uh, plastics, other... Uh, products that derive from petroleum. Uh, I just happen to feel that it's a um, thing we need to stop doing, which is burning it f to move ourselves around. Uh, I think that's a bad thing, a bad use of that resource. Uh, it's, there's much better uses for it. Uh, so I, I, do, I don't, just don't believe in burning it. Sure, Ariane, we haven't heard from you yet. <laughs> and Jim says he doesn't believe in burning gasoline to get ourselves around. Would you agree? And if so, why? Sure. Well, I, I completely agree. Um, I work for Actera, which is a nonprofit environmental organization. And I have to say that 10 years ago, when I started at Actera, I was a um, fairly environmentally conscientious individual. Um, but having worked there for so many years, um, I have become very well educated about the major important environmental issues of our time and the most important one that isn't going to go away for many for for unless we address it is climate change and global warming and that is caused by burning fossil fuels so i feel as though it's extremely important that we eliminate um, all processes by which we burn fossil fuels so I don't want to belabor the point, but there are those who say that global warming has other causes uh, uh, I, over and above just the burning of fossil fuels. It's my understanding that 40% uh, of uh, uh, greenhouse gases, which are creating the insulation layer around the earth that's making us warmer and warmer, is caused by transportation. That's a huge chunk. So. Others say, well, they're cows. I even saw a recent mm -hmm. report. There are, mm -hmm. Our pets are contributing to it. Right. Um, I would say <laughs> that um, right. up until very recently, especially here in California, uh, the burning of fossil fuels to produce electricity was the major component um, of greenhouse gas emissions. But because our grid, our electricity grid, has becoming, is becoming cleaner and cleaner, especially in California, where we are more and more sourcing electricity through green energy sources such as wind, hydro, and solar, our grid is becoming much, much uh, cleaner. And therefore, we are um, using, if you had a pie chart that says how much um, each uh, industry is responsible for greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, electricity generation is reducing itself. And conversely, the uh, slice of the pie taken up by transportation is increasing. And so, Ron, I think you're correct that uh, I think in this area, about 40% of greenhouse gas emissions are due to transporting ourselves. OK, so let us say um, there is that reason and it, uh, a reduction of greenhouse gases, mm -hmm. there's that reason to have an electric vehicle. But it seems that there's also, for every plus, there's a minus. 
And some people say, well, the biggest thing right now, and I read an article that uh, the biggest downside, one of the biggest downsides are just the batteries. How can they be recycled? It's like battery waste. Mm -hmm. And I know in Europe that's, a, that's a, a, a huge problem. Just what do you do with them? Well, the batteries themselves, um, the latest generation of uh, vehicles, things that have been built since 2005, 6, 7 or so, um, no longer have toxins in them. They're not based on lead or cadmium, which are both neurotoxins or elements. So that makes them uh, recyclable. There are some expensive metals inside that they like to reuse. But uh, bottom line is uh, to recycle them is an economic thing. But here's an interesting side uh, piece of information that goes along with that. The batteries are getting so good. They're becoming more efficient. Their capacity is getting better. I just read a study today where some of these batteries are expected to last 500,000 miles, unless you have a, a Volvo or something. Well, this particular article time. states that there will be 140 million electric cars globally by 2030 if countries meet the Paris Climate Agreement target. And this electric vehicle boom could leave 11 million tons of spent lithium ion batteries in need of recycling. Well, here's the thing. The and second, how will that be done? The second use of those batteries, you know, when they're no longer capable of being used in a car, they still have plenty of poop in them, and they are very dangerous, actually. They can be used for whole house backup uh, or other industrial purposes. Grid storage. Grid storage, for example. And that's something, for example, the local company Tesla is taking their very excellent battery that they have in their cars and using it in a industrial uh, power pack called the power, uh, power, wall. power wall and uh, people can install that at home so when the power goes out when some guy crashes into a telephone pole locally and everything goes out they have their lights on all night long you know they don't have to worry about it so the second use is real important there will be less recycling going on than before and the, the recycling of those batteries would probably be for a recovery of the, the expensive metals more than anything now else. The, the lithium yeah. uh, you're saying that this says car producers will be accountable for the collection and recycling of spent lithium. Mm -hmm. And given their sheer size, batteries cannot be stored at home, and landfilling is not an option. Definitely not an option. Right. And it's not, it doesn't make economic sense anyway. Uh, lithium is a valuable resource. It costs a lot of money to extract. And um, that's not something that they're going to let go to waste. So those, uh, the, 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 they will be reprocessed and turned back into batteries. So and the other interesting thing is because they last so much longer, there's a very little chance. You know, people get sick of their car before they <laughs> run out of battery. They're that good. I mean, the batteries are considered pollution equipment in the eyes of cars. So car. tell me, we talk about charging, recharging the battery. Now, with some devices, if you don't charge it, that depletes the battery. It decays by itself. Yeah, yeah so is, does that happen with these types of batteries? Let's say the, the car might sit for two months. Not a problem. No yeah, problem. And it's not charged, issue. and it might be depleted. Not a problem. Well, when you leave a battery uh, depleted, you're asking for trouble. You know, charge it the halfway mark, and then let it sit two, three, four, five, six months, whatever. It's not a problem because they don't, they don't leak. They don't self-discharge by themselves. Those are some of the frailties of the early batteries that self-discharge was a real issue. Overnight, you'd lose 10 miles. Oh, that's terrible. Well, where'd it go? And nowadays, they're holding their charge battery. They're lasting longer, and the cycle life is out to the point where every 500,000 miles, you need a new pack. I think I'll need a new car by then. Okay. Also, um, I should add that once you go EV, such as the three of us have done, you will be charging your car a lot because you will be using it all the time. There's no going back once you have gone EV. Now, one of the biggest complaints or one of the biggest concerns with electric vehicles is how far they can go between charges. Mm -hmm. And I heard one uh, local radio host say that when you turn on the heater or the air conditioner, let's say you're at 90%, that drops the range to 30%. And then if you want to do 70 to 80 miles an hour, 
that drops the range to maybe 45 percent, even lower. And if you go up a steep hill, then you might have end up with the 30 mile range. Those numbers are Oops. Oops. greatly in, those numbers Dropping. are greatly inflated. <laughs> so um, having driven, you know, uh, 80,000 miles in my electric vehicle. Um, yes, speed uh, will reduce your range to a certain extent, maybe 10%. Um, if you're, you know, pedal to the metal doing 85 miles an hour. Uh, the heater is your second biggest enemy. That's why all electric vehicles uh, on the market today have heated seats. Some of them even have heated steering wheel. So you still use the heater, but you use it a lot less. Oh, you mean you just you deal with the cold. <laughs> oh, no. No, or heated seats blind, are like, very you nice. Blind, you, blind, <laughs> you, you put a blanket, you bring a blanket so no, that you No, the don't. heated seats are much more efficient because they're heating your body directly. So the heated seats. Instead seat, of the air. Yeah, instead of, and instead of trying to heat the air. So yeah, you will notice a range reduction of maybe 10, 15% as a result of running the heater full blast. And so the this vehicle speed, uh, you know, if you're going ex in excess of 70 miles an hour, the range will start to drop off noticeably. And if you're going up a San Francisco hill? Then yes, your range will uh, deplete faster, but when you go back down the other side, your battery actually free. gains charge. Yeah, That's the really cool part, and I love making this analogy. They don't have in-flight refueling for gas cars, but for electric cars, when you come down the hill, you're filling your battery. If I go down the Cuesta grade in uh, San Luis Obispo, it's, it's about a 1,500 foot pass. I gain about six miles in range coming down that hill just because the kinetic energy of the car, I'm saying let the motor do the braking. The motor will now be turned into a generator and make electricity. So, stick so it tell in the me, does going down the hill make up for the energy loss going up the hill? Not all of it. Not all oh. of it. Because I would it's say, other than that, you'd look for big hills, right? Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> Go down. <laughs> what goes up must come down. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. So. I actually have a fun anecdotal story about going up a very large hill. I would say personally that my electric vehicle can take me most anywhere I want to go. It is good for 99% of what I need to use a car for. Um, but I am such an EV enthusiast that my husband and I decided that we would take our uh, 93 range Kia Soul to Lake Tahoe. And as you know, Lake Tahoe is you go Further up a very, than 93 miles. <laughs> and you go up a very large hill to get there. So I would not advise um, an individual to take a 93 mile range to Lake Tahoe. However, I can say that um, the ranges of electric automobiles are getting longer and longer. And um, the, there's a few game changers that we all know about that are coming to the market. One of them is already at market. It's the Chevy Bolt. And it has a range of 238 miles. On one charge. On one, one charge. charge. Now, awesome. that one charge, yes. what would that run you? Dollar wise? Yes. Eight, ten bucks? Depends on if you charge. How, how from, many hours? Um, I depends think on the level of charging. Yeah, yes, on, and I guess fast it depends. Chargers. I, I guess, too, you know, I, I, I heard the same <laughs> radio host talk about if you're a wealthy homeowner and you have your own charging unit then you get uh, a deduction for that. The state gives you a rebate for it, maybe $1,500, and you get some rebates right. from PG and E. Yes. However, if you're a renter, uh, you can't have your own charging station. You have to plug it into your 10 volt. 120 whatever. volt. Yes, and that breaks you, what, brings you into another tier, and okay. you pay Lower more. Tier. Can I speak to that? So, sure, so for example, if you live in a, mul so if you're a renter, and you're renting your home, um, the homeowner, the property owner is not allowed to prevent you from installing a charging station for one thing. So that's On the outside of the house? Anywhere. Yeah, you can do that. Now, if you are paying, hmm, if you're rent, well, let's see how does that go. Doesn't that draw more absolutely. on the building's electricity in absolutely. general? Absolutely, absolutely. So, but as a renter, you have your own account with PG&E, so they're charging you for the additional energy, electricity that you're using, and if you are a customer of PG&E, and you use their electricity to charge your car, they will send you a check for $500. So you are saying a, a renter mm -hmm. can install a charging unit? Yes. And if you're on the outside of the building? Sure. 
And if you're renting and a multifamily, if you live in an apartment, um, the, uh, there are programs and the landlord, the property owner, the property manager can actually take credit. There are rebates for installing and providing electric vehicle you would charging have to, for you, your tenants. You would have to then get the approval of the landlord. Of course. Correct. Yes. So if you're living in an apartment complex, uh -huh. it is a little bit trickier yes. to get a charging station because you know, there's multiple units involved and there's a lot of users involved. If you're living in a single home and you're renting, it's, a, it's, it's an easier process. Or if you're the homeowner yourself. Um, Jim Barbera, for example, he really wants to promote his um, you know, EV charging. And so for your rental home, you actually provided the rental equipment for your tenants. Yeah, yeah so I offered that. Uh, they currently drive gas cars, but they said, well, if they ever change to an electric car, the charging station's in the, in the so, building. So, uh, of, of course, uh, one has to then add up the charge of the purchase of the charging unit. Yes. What does that run? Anywhere from $295 to maybe $800, depending on whose brand you get. And then the installation can be done by And a that's not a monthly charge? No, that's it's a one-time thing. That's for the equipment. Yeah. And then there's the installation, which is a one-time thing. But an electrician, would, a competent, licensed, insured electrician could probably do that from $300 to maybe $1,200 or $1,500, depending how complicated you are. If you've got to snake the wires all around. Depends on how far it is from the electrical uh -huh. panel. Uh huh. So there are some charges. So it seems to me you before you go into that type of cost, you really have to yes. believe that this is going to be a savings for you. Uh, yes. Although, and I myself am a perfect example of this scenario. You do not have to actually install install a charging unit uh, at your home or at your um, apartment because there are three levels of charging that you can uh, use to charge your car. Uh, the first level is level one, and sometimes people call that trickle charging because it is very, very slow. However... And what is that? Is that your house? Yeah, yes. The, household. the one, 110 yes, volt? Yes, right. you mm -hmm. can use a regular 120 outlet with your cord that is given to you by the vehicle manufacturer. You plug it in anywhere, basically, that you can charge a if cell you phone. Have, if, if you have a house. I mean, if yes. you live in the, an apartment on the fifth floor, then you can. Then you're where going do you to, plug into your exactly. Then you're going to want to encourage your um, property manager to install EV charging stations. Unless there's an outlet someplace in the parking garage. Exactly. 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 <laughs> exactly. Now so that's a very slow charge. If there is a parking lot. Now, if it's out on the street, I mean, if that's the closest, then you can't do it. Right. Yeah. Right. But there are options. There are so many options. And I think that that's work. a misperception that well, there's not enough charging stations. Yes. Well, you know, this, this same radio host said uh, after going up the hill or turning on his air conditioner or heater, he had maybe 10 mile range left. So he had to pull off the freeway and look for a charging station. And of course, charging stations are not as pervasive as gasoline stations where there might Today. be one on every corner, right. and you might get to one, and I'd you like already have some. That. I'd like to you, counter you that. You might find somebody else already using it. So what happens if you go to the nearest one and they're let, in let use? Me, let me speak to that. There are sure. 40,000 of these things around. Let, and there's, there's even more than that. Yeah. The 120 volt outlet, which will allow you to charge, albeit very slowly, is ubiquitous in any habitable building in the US, unless you're in Amish country. If you're talking a habitable building, you need water, you need sewer, and you need electricity. I have gone up to a complete stranger's house when I had a problem with my lead sled way back in the 1990s. <clears throat> had a problem, and I needed a boost. I, it was dusk. I needed to get three more miles down the road to home. And if I had turned on my headlights, uh, it would drain the 12-volt battery. And the 12-volt battery was used to power the main contactor, which connected the big battery to the motor. So I needed to drive around without my headlights. But I stopped at a guy's house, and I said, $5 bill, can I borrow some electricity? And the guy said, who are you? I said, yes, I'm in trouble. You? Come on outside and look at my electric car. And why would he do that? Come he outside. He wanted the $5 real quick. Yeah, exactly. Just $5? And I have a, a similar something? story. Way more than what the electricity he used was worth. Let me, let me finish. It was really interesting. The guy, first off, let me plug in, and I needed about 20 minutes worth of charging. And it was a literally a 12-volt battery charger from Sears, no less. 
and I had it with me because I knew this was going to happen, and I just hadn't gotten around to fixing my problem until that night. You know, I stayed up late to get that thing taken care of. We became fast friends. When I bought my real factory car in 2002, I went back and showed him, and now he's driving a Nissan Leaf. But the bottom line is it started with I gave him probably $4.50 profit on 50 cents worth of electricity. I was there maybe a half an hour. We talked and talked, and I came back a couple of days later, and I said, I got it fixed. Here's what I did. And it turns out we became friends, and I still know who the guy is now, and we drive by there so, every day. Oh le gosh. Let us say you're on Highway 101 <laughs> going from San Francisco sure. down to Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. You don't have any charging stations on the freeway. Oh, yeah. They're right off. You have Some to of them pull are right off the freeway. Off the freeway. Yes. But they're at the right at the exit. Usually within, within you don't have gas stations on the freeway either. And the thing about it is, how available are they? So Given the hundreds of thousands, and you know, I was reading an article that Tesla, by the end of 2018, wants to sell at least 450,000 mm -hmm. electric vehicles mm -hmm. with 10,000 a month. Mm -hmm. Now, at that rate, we're just going to change one type of traffic jam for another, aren't we? Okay, so electric vehicles aren't necessarily no. the the um, the salve that's going to heal our congestion problem in the Bay Area. You know, there's a lot of, um, it's a very intricate problem, but electric vehicles will solve many other problems. And as I am a proponent of um, green energy, electric vehicles really are the solution in terms of global warming. But there are so many other advantages about electric vehicles that I would like to bring up. But just to really address once more your question about the, the charging stations, if, if you could show the graphic, um, then we can talk about how plentiful charging stations are. OK, at least in California, maybe. So could yes, we see correct. the graphic about the charging stations? Sure. There what is I, this map with little. What I'd like little to do also is add that 80 to 90% of all electric vehicle owners charge at home. It's the predominant charging. Very few buy a vehicle and then realize I to run charge to it Ikea. In public. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I Ikea or yeah. exactly. Walmart. Yes, Whole Foods. Uh, yeah, exactly. yeah, so we have the map up there. Sure. Yeah, cool. So now, this is an old map. This is there's actually there are actually many more than this shown now. Explain what the color dots mean. But but you know what I'm thinking if you have in the Bay Area, how many vehicles are we talking about? But if you have maybe 100,000, can they be serviced? Mm -hmm. Yes, easily. Oh, yeah. no, you know what? The biggest problem, what happens if there's a blackout? Or a brownout. That's <laughs> where, that's that's where the you brownout, take the your... Oh, brownout I don't your know. entire life lasted. I don't know. It can be for a day, half a day. It depends. This is true. That's and where you depends. take... And you know what? That's when you're low. <laughs> you know, when you really <laughs> haven't Murphy's charged. But yes. Is your blackout, <laughs> has there been, ever been a blackout that has encompassed more than a square mile or two? A whole city. Yeah. I remember How being big is in, a whole city? But wait, I remember being in New York City. I think oh it might be gosh. nine miles, the island of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And the whole city went out. It, so. it went out. And that, what year was that? I don't want to say. But so, <laughs> in the future, <laughs> if this happens, they are, actually, they are actually exploring that, that was ways at least, what, to hours. have your car battery, let's say your car battery has 80% charge and there is a blackout, they're actually exploring ways where you can tap into your car's battery to give your home energy in case of a blackout. Oh, and then not expect to drive your car. <laughs> well, you can have your cake and eat it, too. You, but wait a moment. <laughs> if there is an emergency yeah. and your family's home and, you know, you don't, no candle lights, it's nighttime, <laughs> and you want to run out and get something, oh, sorry, everybody, light the candles. So in the, in the five years I've been driving electric vehicles, I've never had a situation that, that, where that occurred, number one. Number two... 90% of the charging, as Ron said, happens at home. There's, there are two places you spend most of the time. And the one thing I want to do, one, the one thing I do want to focus on, it is a completely different fueling paradigm to compared to a gas vehicle. Because in a gas vehicle, you drive the car, and then you say, oh, my tank is empty, or I need gas. I need to go someplace and drive to a gas station and fill my tank. In an electric car, I pull into my garage or I pull into my workplace and there are the charging stations I charge right there. And every time I get into my car, it's 
Four. And you know what? You never make a mistake and forget to pay your utility bill. <laughs> Oh, and, I've done that. And Henrietta. <laughs> you couldn't charge your car thing, could you? No, I would go to work and charge it. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, do you remember yes. it was only a few years ago when there were rolling brownouts? Mm -hmm. Remember when yeah. California rolling was blackout. cursing electricity from, I don't know, the Midwest? Oklahoma. And there was some yep. type of game going on yep. with the utility companies. Some funny so units. what ha yeah, mm -hmm. so what happens then? Right. So that's when you buy a used electric vehicle battery to use as backup electricity uh -huh. storage. And there solves the issue of recycling the battery. Even though the batteries can absolutely, I agree with both of you, be recycled because the components in there are highly recyclable. So Invaluable. there's a market. And how There's much? a market for those That's used. That's the most important, the most expensive thing about the car, the battery, absolutely, right? Absolutely. So how single, much single does the Single most battery? expensive component. A Nissan Leaf battery will run $5,500. Oh my God. Replaced. replaced. Replacement. Yes. Yeah. But you know, is that, that there's never a malfunction when they're made. You know, with everything else, there's a lemon. Do you they have get great warranties. Lemon warranted batteries. for eight years or 100,000 miles. Because they're considered pollution equipment yeah. by CARB regulations. You know, the regulations, we didn't have regulation back when we had the rolling blackouts. That was an experiment and in you grid might, deregulation. But, but you know what? Under this administration, you might have even <laughs> less regulations. <laughs> well, it's something. That I think uh, the California Air... Um, Air Resources Board has grandfathered the EPA because they were around when Ronnie Reagan invented it in 1967, but the EPA didn't come around until 1970. So, and Richard Nixon created the EPA. So, ah. we have grandfathered all our air pollution requirements, grandfather all the EPA stuff, so they can't tell us to stop because we got really? the worst problem in the nation here. We've got many basins, like the LA Basin, rimmed with high mountains, and the stuff stays in the bowl. And, uh, it's so you mean the new uh, environmental head of the Environmental Protection Agency? Yeah, Scott can't, yes, can't uh, change any. Don't of think California. so. It'll be challenged at the Supreme Court. Level. Oh, I, 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 I know it. every I well, every lawyer, and, and environmental and lawyer. And the good news will be. is, the auto manufacturers are figuring out that people like electric vehicles, and they are all mm -hmm. starting to manufacture mm -hmm. with without pressure, mm -hmm. voluntarily, figuring out that. The ones they did under pre the ones that they manufactured under pressure, five, six, seven years ago, now people are starting. Demand is starting to ramp up. They are contagious. So, so, but wait a moment. You know that really puts an extra demand on the grid. You know, if you have all of these electric cars plugged in, air conditioners put a bigger Here's demand the on the grid than the yes, electric. but but. Your dryer puts a bigger demand on Well, there. actually, that's not quite true. Okay. No, here's, here's, no. Here's so, the, so wait a moment. Goes. So you have your dryer, you have your air conditioner, mm -hmm. and uh, there are hundreds of thousands of electric vehicles plugged in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's that going to mean? Maybe let's, even a let's million. Let's look at the loads for starters. Um, in your house, you have big consumers like air conditioners, furnaces, ovens, ranges. Dryers. Ovens, ovens are things where they consume about 1,800 watts when they're on broil mode. And once you add up the temperature, they actually turn off and they cycle on off on off trying to maintain temperature how long do you bake a turkey for two three hours it's never full blast 1800 watts for three or four hours now a hot tub heater when it's trying to heat up the heat uh, heat up the water that's a big consumer it'll be on six eight ten hours whatever but the biggest single load is an electric vehicle because it's 100% duty cycle means there's no cycling. It's just full blast until it's done. Okay, so there are hundreds of thousands or millions of them plugged in. Right. What type of load? Let's say for a city like Palo Alto, 56,000 or 59,000 mm -hmm. people. And if 30,000 of them have electric vehicles, which would not be inconceivable, mm -hmm. three per family, that would be even more yeah. like Here's you. Here's the thing. Let's, Let's say 60,000 plugged in well, in a city. What does so that So they're already at 5.5% 5 5 of the registered vehicles in the city of Palo Alto are yeah, plug-in or elect fully electric, mm -hmm. plug-in hybrid or fully electric. The good news is they're not all going to descend on us tomorrow. The grid will grow to meet this demand. The, the dem in other words, they're not, happy, they're not so coming wait a overnight. Moment. Wait a moment. How do we know the grid will grow? Let me, I let mean, me we have a, to... Let me cite a study from 2007. EPRI, the Electric <clears throat> Power Research Institute, right up here on Xerox Sand Hill, Hill, yes. Sand Hill Road. They have yes. charging stations in their parking lot. Yeah, good. Um, 
they did a study and they said if magically we could say all light duty uh, trucks and um, car passenger cars in America to switch right now and become electric, 83% of them would be able to be fueled without building a single extra power plant. And this was done 10 years ago. And things have gotten a lot better, but the grid has been more stabilized. We have even more renewable sources. And we've been decreasing our number of coal burning stations by replacing the coal burners with gas, natural gas burners. Still a fossil fuel, but it's, it's cleaner. So way back then, they said, pshaw, let's, let's not uh, fan the fires of hysteria. And you know, the grid can handle it. And since then, many other studies have gone, come along by unions of concerned scientists and uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs, the National Labs, uh, it's NREL, um, mm -hmm. National Renewable Energy Lab in Idaho. They've done all these studies. And they have said, we have no problem with additional power. And the bigger issue is getting the power from where it's being generated to those faraway places like downtown Laramie, Wyoming. I mean, everybody needs power, but there aren't necessarily power plants nearby there. So do you know, I, it, it makes me think I can remember there are times when we're told, and I can remember like within the past two years, don't everybody use your washing machines mm -hmm. <laughs> during the daytime. Remember? Because of the demand on the electric grid or, all, uh, or the air From conditioners. From air conditioners. Yes. Yeah. So if that's a problem just in and of itself, and that's recently, mm -hmm. how all of a sudden are we going to have enough? That's got to be a localized time of use. problem. And right. it's time of exactly. use. Exactly. So when you plug in, there, there, there are two peak times when electric vehicles are charging. Um, when At you, nighttime, I think, mm -hmm. when you come home. Well, so all electric vehicles have timers. So you can choose when the vehicle actually starts charging. You plug it in, and you walk away. But if you have a hundred or a million people plugging in their vehicles, let's say 50,000 in Palo Alto, three vehicles, mm -hmm. I, I know not everybody's going to have three <laughs> electric vehicles per family, mm -hmm. a, a lot of it will be plugged in at the same time uh, during a... I, I don't so plug in my three it. vehicles yeah. every night. I do one of them on Tuesdays, maybe next time on Friday. So last night, uh, I plugged one car in the first time in a week. The random nature. But that's, that's, one house, <laughs> yeah. that's one household. Sure. Mm -hmm. But if you multiply that by 30,000 people. See, that's where the computer nerds get really good with <laughs> stochastic modeling. They model all these things. They say, with a random nature, this guy's only going to charge that long, and that guy's going to do it that long. They model all that, and that's where EPRI comes up with their estimates and saying, we don't have a problem here yet. And yet. it'll be a long yet. time to convert yet. the entire population of mm -hmm. vehicles. Mm -hmm. We've got but, 100 but the way, million but vehicles. But the way Tesla's doing it, just Tesla, talking but, about 430,000 by but the end of 18 and 10,000 mm -hmm. per... They're not all going in one place. They'll be so, shipping the them to Europe yes, and to China. But the China. electric grid, the elect, you, how many electric grids do we have in this country? And does some of it come from Canada through yes. the Midwest? And we're all it's dependent. It's all one grid. Yes, but and when one part of it goes down, doesn't that affect? No, not necessarily. They're, they're, that's where Cal ISO comes in. California um, independent I'm system operators. I'm glad you're good when you did <laughs> say that the, there would be these acronyms. Yeah, <laughs> the California uh, independent system operator are the people that run the uh, the the grids from the three three big uh, independent uh, owned utilities: uh, PG&E, Southern California Edison, and S San Diego Gas and Electric. They kind of orchestrate that, and then there's all sorts of other little ones like Palo Alto Municipal. Mm -hmm. Santa Clara has its uh, own municipal utility. And you know, the people in Santa Clara have a fixed rate. They pay 10 cents a kilowatt hour for forever. And the big, uh, you know, the big industries like Intel, they get hit for the big charges. Uh, but the California ISO, they're the one that orchestrates all that. And they say, hey, we need a little more power from the Bonneville plant up there on Portland's, uh, what, Portland, the Columbia River. And aren't those hydroelectric dams or they something? They are, and they send and, their power and, south. And, and, yeah, but do those dams ever have problems? I think they do. Sometimes they I take the generator of out was, of service. Yes, yeah, and, 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 yeah to, and drain it to fix it. Or, well, the, you can't stop the Columbia with, River. Yeah, but I do remember <laughs> reading just recently, it wasn't Niagara Falls, that one, Hoover Dam, I think it was Hoover Dam mm -hmm. that was clean the first time in maybe 50 years. Wow. They were maybe taking advantage of the, the low water, water level. Yeah. yeah, and the first time exactly. the water was stopped. And it was, okay, so what happens right. to the electricity from the Hoover Dam? Well, it's made up by other, other sources. Ah. 
uh, the, the electricity and in, in a time of drought, what happens? Like in California, when there was the water level was so low. What drought does that is, do a, for is electric a, not power? a phenomenon that happens very quickly. It's a very slow coming phenomenon. We had drought for five years, and the grid is live and dynamic. Every second, we need to be able to balance the high current demand from here and the extra feed from there. That's what the Cal ISO does. They shuttle the power okay, around. Okay, so let us talk about if there would be any effect because of global warming. Would that in itself, with that increasing, have Again, an effect? That's what we're trying range. to do by driving electric vehicles. I know, vehicles. I know, but... It's a long-term you know, effect. There's, yeah. It's a very yes, long-term effect. Yes, but I'm, I'm thinking, how will that affect electricity, the demand for electricity? If you're only talking hydro, we're going to have a serious problem. But we're talking wind. There's huge gigawatts, lots and lots, lots of wind of being grown up in the last five, six, seven years. And we're adding solar faster than we're adding any other source. In fact, solar and wind are now very price competitive with coal and nuclear. Let in us fact, hope it's even better. It's, it is. And it's so, going lower so and So has anybody told Trump? <laughs> so, in two so I want to give you a, I want to give you a couple of numbers. He's increasing the coal manufacturing. No, I would like to give you some numbers. So, okay. So in 2008, <laughs> and I used 2008 because that's when I started paying attention to where the electricity comes from because that's when I started being interested in electric vehicles. And the first thing I ha heard, and actually I believe this myself, well, they're just coal-powered cars, <laughs> right? So. 48% of the electricity generated in 2008 came from coal, nationwide, Nation. US, US grid mix, okay? Uh, last Hours. year, 27%. So the coal is going offline, other sources are coming online. That has been largely supplanted by natural gas and solar and wind. And so, there's almost no oil. In 1979, yeah. we were still making a lot of electricity by burning oil. Mm -hmm. And that's down to less than 1% nationwide now. Yeah. So. But yeah, go ahead. So the point I want to make is that when you drive your electric vehicle off the lot, that is the dirtiest it will ever be. Every kilowatt hour of electricity generated is cleaner than the pri previous kilowatt hour. So. And to, wait, I'd like to finish. Conversely, your gasoline vehicle is the cleanest it will ever be the day you drive it off the lot because every drop of petroleum used to be burnt in that vehicle is more expensive, more damaging, and harder to extract. So and then when you're 150,000 miles, the car is really dirty, and that's why it doesn't sometimes pass smog when it's so old, and you got to toss it away. Mm -hmm. So right now we have hybrid vehicles. Mm -hmm. Would it make sense? to get a hybrid vehicle that gives you the option of using gasoline. For some people. And as engines or the batteries get better, can a hybrid vehicle be converted to one that's completely electric? Yes, actually. Just keep plugging it in. You, never, you, you can literally drive a oh. plug-in hybrid an entire year. As a matter of fact, there's a computer in there that keeps track of the age of the gas. It knows when you put fresh gas in. And at some point it will say, the gas in this car is getting old. I'm going to actually run the engine just to keep the gas from getting old. But it is perfectly possible to drive a plug-in hybrid car 100% on electricity for the entire life of the car. Let me without give you a good example. Without using the gasoline Correct. at all. Without using so the would, would the hybrid car be more expensive? than an all-electric vehicle? So I would, just no. looking recently at the Chevy Bolt, which is all-electric versus the Chevy Volt, I would say the lease prices are actually about equal. Not similar. But people who decide to, to go to use a hybrid electric vehicle are those individuals who aren't quite ready to make the leap to all-electric. If they feel as though they have long commutes, if their workplace doesn't, doesn't provide charging stations, if they want to go visit their relatives in Sacramento or Los Angeles once a month. Those are the types of people that might feel more comfortable taking that middle step and choosing a plug-in hybrid. Seems to me that might be the best of both worlds. It's the it no-brainer car. It's, yeah, a, it's a stepping stone. Eventually, yes. we'll be four steps down the road, and many more people will be pure electric. But in the meantime, a plug-in hybrid is perfect. Let's go. Especially for a single-vehicle household. The Volt, the Volt, not the Bolt EV, but the, the, it's a series hybrid. It's got an electric motor mm -hmm. that's driven by 
batteries, and when the batteries are depleted, a gas generator comes on, makes electricity, and drives the electric motor. Oh, really? It doesn't. The mechanics of the gas generator never drive so, the wheels. Uh, so what you're wheels. saying is the gas gasoline will recharge the, the battery, battery exactly right. itself. Exactly right. And no. you can do this until the gasoline runs out. Exactly. And then you can charge your car by plugging it in. And you, or you fill up a tank again. Jay Leno had a Volt, uh, an early Volt, 2011, I believe, and he drove it something at like 10 or 20,000 miles, and still had the original tank of gas in it from the dealer. Oh. From the dealer, and he says my lifetime average is something like 550 miles a gallon. It was incredible. There was a competition. Mm -hmm. And they actually interviewed him on Jay Leno's Garage or something like this. It seems the best of both worlds. Yeah. I mean, if you don't want to take the big step of yeah, going exactly. pure electric, right. however, go to hybrid. However, however. There is always a however. <laughs> right. a however, because the technology is improving so quickly that battery ranges are becoming such that in a, in a year or two, most of the cars <laughs> that are available will have an over- 200 mile range well, and that will meet most yes. people's needs most however, of the time. However, I think an, another however, it would seem to me the bigger the battery the more you pay, right? <laughs> Absolutely. For the car. Yes, but the co the cost of the battery are actually going down. The so. cost per kilowatt hour, the cost for the same capacity, um, a battery with, with um, 20 kilowatt hours five years ago, now you can get three times the capacity for about the same price. But so. it's still... So, Henrietta, I should, I should mention that actually lease prices, lease deals for electric vehicles have actually been going down. So that gets us into, and I, I was going to say to you, you know, uh, uh, one radio host, the same radio host, said that there was discrimination between the renters and the house owners in terms of the subsidies the frequency with which they can charge the car and just the ownership of the car. So what you are saying is that even low-income people. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about sure. that. Sure. Um, so the state of California in particular is very aggressive about wanting to increase, to create widespread adoption of electric vehicles. So the state of California offers rebates to anyone who leases or purchases electric vehicles. Um, and I should back up and say that this is on top of a federal rebate that we don't know how much longer it will be around, but it is a very substantial... A federal tax credit. Yes. So do you mean I should at this point think of not driving my 22-year-old car even though... <laughs> well, what I should say is it's these dirty. financial incentives have been provided to early adopters in order to spur widespread adoption. So who is an early adopter? You can be an early adopter, and we're early adopters. <laughs> you all are early adopters, yep. given yep. how long you've been, you know, yes, using, exactly. a, I would yep. think I'd be a late adopter. Yep. How do you define an early no. adopter? Well, you it's actually, still early. It's still <laughs> early. It's very early. Even though there are so many electric vehicles, as you quoted, on the road, they're still less than 1% of all new car That's sales right. in the nation, slightly higher in the Bay Area. So you can, anyone out there right now can still be an early adopter and can still benefit from all of the financial so we, incentives. So we, we have a chart, I think, with some sure. figures. Yes, and we do. So if we could pull up that yeah. one chart that we have. Exactly. And as Ariane yes. talks about sure. it. Sure. Um, so let, let us get our, or, or you can say some, yes. uh, oh, here we go. Okay, great. So um, yes, I just want to quickly go through all of the financial incentives so that people know how affordable electric vehicles can be. It can be cheaper than a cell phone. Oh my goodness, what cell phone are it's, we talking well, about? Well, oh. I mean, the monthly, the monthly lease payment can be lower than what so you pay you know, to have, have a cell phone. These, I, I have one of these pay He's as you kidding. go, and yeah. for three months it's right. like $19. Can't beat that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Although I did see a Volkswagen e-Golf a few months ago. The lease offer was $29 a month. Really? I'm not kidding you. Where was it? It was uh, in the East Bay, Richmond, I think. Oh, okay. Is it still available? It was a few months ago. So we, <laughs> there will be others. Those are gone, but there will be others. <laughs> At any rate, so the federal government uh, gives individuals who purchase an electric vehicle a $7,500 tax credit. And 
that's um, not exactly cash in hand, but when you do your taxes, it reduces the amount that you have to pay if you owe taxes. So if you owe $10,000 worth in taxes on a given year that you buy your electric vehicle, that amount that you owe is reduced by $7,500. if you don't owe? You, you have to you, owe. You have to <laughs> owe. <laughs> Let me be, let's be clear about this. If, if you do a refund, oh, you don't get the $7,500 it's, it. it's not a matter, matter of whether you owe or get a refund because of your withholding because you're withholding throughout the year, right? They're usually taking a little bit out of your paycheck because they don't want you to owe, they want you to about break even. But what they're saying is they're reducing your tax liability. So nice. even if you break even, you will get $7,500 reduced from your tax liability. So even if you've been paying and you're, you're due a refund, now you're that refund, let's say you're, you're due a refund of $1,000 or $500, that refund will increase by $7,500. So you mean that would be cash in hand? Or that would be correct. You gotta wait till the, that that would be April no, you gotta 15th. wait till the following you gotta wait till the tax you do the taxes for the year you buy the car. So if you buy a car in twenty seventeen, you would do it on your in twenty eighteen and your twenty seventeen taxes. Would that be equivalent to getting cash back? Yes. Okay, oh, so really? yes. so I'm sorry, th then my information is potentially wrong because my understanding was that it takes um, reduces your tax liability, but it does not um, if you have uh, that tax yeah, liability, it, but if right, you don't, it, that you don't get a refund. But you know, ask your tax accountant about mm -hmm. that. That I'd would love be one reason why you want a lease because you can negotiate your uh, lease so that the dealer will get the seventy-five hundred. Actually, it's the finance company. Thank the you. The finance company <laughs> takes the seventy-five hundred dollars. The feds give that to them immediately, and they'll reduce the price. They don't have to. They're not obligated to reduce the price by that seventy-five hundred dollars. But if they don't. Take a walk. Oh, <laughs> I certainly you'll find would. If right. they're getting seven thousand five hundred dollars right. and they don't give me Credit the benefit of exactly. it, exactly, because they want to move that car, right? So they want to get that car off the lot. So, so that's the seventy five hundred dollars from the federal government. Tax but wait, credit. there's more. But wait, there's more. <laughs> there's As more. I mentioned, the state of California is aggressively wanting people to go EV, so they are offering an up to twenty five hundred dollar rebate if you purchase or lease an electric vehicle. Now, the that's the size of the rebate is based on the size of the battery. So if it's basically if it's an all electric vehicle, you'll get that full twenty five hundred dollars. If it's a plug in hybrid, you'll probably get more closer to fifteen hundred. On top of that, if you are a low to moderate income earner, there are additional rebate that you get from the state of California. So that's where our chart um, comes into play. So if you look at the chart and you think so about can your, can we pull it up one more time? Okay, certainly. So if you look at the chart, let's say you are a family of four and your combined household income is less than $73,800, you qualify for an additional $2,000 rebate for purchasing or leasing an electric vehicle from the state of California. So that's a total from the state of California, that's a total of $4,500. And if you buy a recharging unit, you even get more? And uh, um, not if, but if you're a PG&E customer, uh. you get a check from them for $500, and that can be used towards the purchase of an e of a level two e uh, charging station, which generally run around $500. Only if it's PG&E, but not Only some other PG local customer. Uh, uh, not not any local ones like Palo Alto utility. Uh, the or? city of Palo Alto doesn't have that incentive uh -huh. because they're their own utility. They have other incentives actually for within the city of Palo Alto for EV charging stations. If you are a um, a multi-unit dwelling or a nonprofit organization, uh, you actually can get rebates on installing your charging systems. If so you're a nonprofit. If you're a nonprofit or a multi-unit dwelling. So if you're a nonprofit, can you buy or lease uh, an electrical vehicle uh, well, with rebates? So, for example, Actera is a nonprofit. And um, we're an environmental organization, so one of the first things we did was uh, purchase a charging station, and we supplied that for our staff. And it's the staff of the nonprofit that go ahead and purchase or lease the electric vehicles. But the nonprofit doesn't get credit for, let's say, purchasing electric vehicles. Well, it depends. If you're in the city of Palo Alto, they are offering uh, subsidies oh. for the purchase and installation of electric vehicle charging stations. Okay, just the stations, just not the, the stations. vehicles. Exactly. So in the five minutes that we oh. have left, I know time goes by so quickly. Oh, there's more benefits that we would love well, to talk about. Well, let's talk about the benefits, but we don't have much. The okay. five went to three. All right, can I take one? <laughs> um, if you, <laughs> it, so if you purchase or lease an electric vehicle, you get a sticker that allows you to drive in the carpool lane even if you are the only person driving your car. 
So you can imagine what benefit that is to daily commuters. And how full the carpool lane is getting. <laughs> I use the carpool lane sometimes yes. when I need to, and yes. um, on my commute to Campbell every day is clean and green. I've oh, never gotten terrific. Trip. So uh, terrific. I would like to take one. It is the ideal car for busy people because there's no maintenance. Wiper blades, washer fluid. Um, you want, can change the cabin, the air conditioning filter if you have one, um, and then rotate tires. But otherwise, there are no timing belts, tune-ups, oil changes, no smog checks. So think of all the time you see. Fuses? Sing. Well, fuses are there in any par a car, but when was the last time you blew a fuse in your car? <laughs> so in terms of routine maintenance, there is none, really. There is um, no the changing the oil. Like no, nope. no. Nope. Dealers unless, don't like them because they unless, like to have you come back. And you yes, know, but wait a moment. A grave. We'll if you have a, you. if you have a hybrid, it's the same thing. Then there's a little bit then more maintenance. Bit more. But the engine almost never runs, so the engine isn't based on months or miles. It's based on hours of the engine running. So if the engine doesn't run, they so they have a oil life indicator on the computer, and it basically says, well, you're hardly using the thing. You don't need to change the oil. So it doesn't. It do, it's not by every 7,500 miles like it is in a car. Okay. Where do you start? <laughs> I, I, I'm I'll just, take another I'm, one. I'm super enamored by the fact that I don't have to go someplace. Uh, my wife has often in the past kicked me and said, oh, I got a meeting in Palo Alto tomorrow. <sighs> the little gas light came on. Can you go fill it up? So I pull on my pants and go, <laughs> to the, oh, you go down that. the Rotten Robbie or whatever and tank it up. <laughs> Being able to fill up at home means I don't have to go anywhere. I come home. And I can always wake up with a full tank. That to me is really, really nice. Yes, uh, as long as you remember no to pay the, the utility bill. Keep <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. coming back to the utility yes, bill. If I've got you one more. Get one more. <laughs> okay, and this is probably a nice note to end on. Electric vehicles are just more fun to drive. They're quiet. They're smooth as silk. The acceleration just flows. The acceleration from zero to 30 beats any traditional gas-powered car. You like that, And Barbie. if I could just make one little tiny... Well, you can, except for the fact we need to have people know where they can contact you if they Absolutely. have questions. Sure. So any of us or any of Actera's EV ambassadors, which are basically EV-owning enthusiasts, can answer anybody's questions uh, by going to actera.org. Actera.org. And then slash go EV. Actera.org slash go, go EV. Okay. And they can um, fill out a little form and request an EV consultation. And Perfect. you can get Ron, you can get Jim, myself, or any other um, electric vehicle owner that will give you a call and answer all your questions and concerns that you have about electric vehicles. Well, I've had a lot of questions, and I think I've been fortunate having you <laughs> to answer them. And so maybe. Uh, you can get some callers who will ask you questions that I didn't ask you. <laughs> We're ready. <laughs> It'll be a pleasure. <laughs> or just to restate some of the <laughs> benefits and add more benefits. So I'd like to thank you for the insights you've given us about the benefits and the cons <laughs> yeah. of having an electric I don't think any of us will vehicle. say that there's any cons. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'd like to also thank the viewers for watching. Until next time.